You're listening to the Ask Drone You podcast. You ask, we answer your drone questions. Whether you're here to turn your passion into profit or you simply fly for fun, we're a community of learners and teachers who aspire to achieve greatness. We are Drone You. Hey everyone, and welcome to another very interesting episode of Ask Drone You. My name is Paul, as always, and I have a very special guest. I have John Wakey, who has been a firefighter in one of our largest cities in America for almost 20 years. John, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Paul. So today, what are we talking about? We are talking about the five biggest problems that are plaguing uh, public safety programs. And uh, just to get this knocked out of the way, if you are looking for a digital download on the biggest problems of drone programs, you can download our guide at props.thedroneu.com and check out an expanded list of what we're about to go into. But that said, John, uh, you know, talking about the five biggest problems. One of the biggest problems that we notated, uh, thanks to you, and also from feedback from other public safety groups we've worked with, seems to be the number one problem is a lack of training. Or maybe it's not just a lack of training, but a lack of standardized training. So help us understand what do you mean by the biggest problems of public safety groups is a lack of training? Well, there is no standardized training because every department operates differently from one another. Uh, they all have different demographics. Um, some might be in an urban area, rural area. They might have, you know, high elevation changes, low elevation changes. So every department is pretty unique in what their use cases are going to be for that equipment. So really, a standardized training is just not going to work. Um, where it's just, okay, train from A to Z and you're done. Every department has these specific use cases that are unique to their department and their department only and different, you know, issues within their department on how they operate where they might have the same demographic, you know, like area wise as one location, but they might operate completely different than what their neighboring you know, town would operate as. So there's just um, no real clear way to standardize a training across the board. Um, so it's really got to be tailored, you know, specifically to a department when it comes to, you know, select use cases. But also it seems like it's really important to give them methodologies that have worked across thousands of other trainings to kind of simplify the training process as a whole, right? Absolutely. I mean, there are very, uh, there are constants as long, you know, as we know, there's variables, but there are constants. Certain things remain the same. Like you are going to, you know, do your pre-flight checks. You are going to do the, you know, check what airspace you're in. There's a lot of, you know, constants that need to be addressed um, before you start your operation. But once you get up in the air, it's, you know, that operation is, you know, kind of unique to, um, even though, like it's unique to your department on even like what you would do with like the footage or the data you collect. And it's the flight plan might be the same between, you know, multiple different departments, but what they do with it afterwards is completely different. Yeah. And now we tried to solve this problem with a props public safety program with giving them methodologies from drone you that we've used for operational training, but also in creating systems from your experiences to give them uh, a modus operandi or a, a very specific way of going about operations as a whole. Yeah, correct. So that's what the props does is it gives you that level of standardization as far as this is what is expected of you. It is up to the pilot to like then now with the knowledge that they get from props to customize or tweak those operations to meet their use case and to, you know, better serve their public. Well, I mean, I think that we definitely did a good job at solving that problem, but it'll be interesting to get feedback uh, from other groups. If you want to check it out, go to props.thedroneu.com. Uh, now, one of the other biggest problems that was notated here was the really the lack of, you know, U.S. or domestically made drones, you know, with the scrutiny on DJI, with the limitations of purchasing their equipment. I know there's a mad scramble right now to try to purchase as much equipment as possible, but it seems like there is not really a good U.S. drone manufacturer to essentially give you equipment that works. Is that right? 
Uh, well, I don't want to say that there's no good UA um, United States manufacturers. There's plenty of them, and we have tech new companies opening up all the time. It's just a lot of times um, they're priced very, very high and out of the reach of you know a standard department's budget. Um, now, when they're priced this high, are they also comparable in features and capability? Uh, so they're they're extremely overpriced, is what I'm saying. Where you would be able to get, we'll say, well, I'm going to just use the Mavic Advanced. Um, you get a ton of features with that, and then you would see a similar aircraft, which is not the same size. It's a lot larger, um, priced like almost 10x over what the cost of that Mavic Advanced would be. And I mean, normally. You used to see like the big drones were there. Now mm -hmm. we're starting to realize that a smaller footprint is one not, it's a lot easier to manage, um, especially on scene. You're, you're talking a smaller landing zone, um, less people to set it up. It's easy to maneuver um, where you have those problems with the big aircraft. And so size plays a factor in that. And we're just not seeing like a lot of these American manufacturers manufacturing equipment that's comparable in size and at a good price point, that comes with the features that we're seeing elsewhere from other companies. So that actually brings up an important question, uh, which is, you know, kind of better understanding what are the best public safety drones that are out there. I mean, we've got the Mavic 2 Enterprise Dual Advanced, and this is the newer Mavic Dual Advanced. And I actually learned something from you that the thermal camera is literally 17 times more capable on this Mavic uh, Enterprise Dual Advanced than the original Mavic Dual. And then, you know, kind of taking that drone and comparing it to, say, the Autel Enterprise or some of the other Enterprise drones, when it comes to the best drones for public safety, you already talked about the importance of a small footprint. You already talked about the importance of portability. What really are the best drones, in your opinion, for public safety? See, I'm a big fan of the smaller footprint, um, but having a smaller footprint leaves you at, you know, uh, you're not going to be able to use it for like metering or hazmat or to transport equipment, stuff like that. So it really, like I said, it's unique to that department. Um, but as far as when it comes to the best drone, it's the drone that you do your work with, the one that you know inside and out, the one that you are able to use as a tool to get the best information possible. That's what we're seeing is like the best type of drone. But if, as of right now, as technology keeps progressing and changing and things become more advanced, we're starting to see the smaller drones, the smaller footprint drones, the Autel Evo uh, Advanced, or what is it? The, the Evo? Autel Evo 2 uh, <laughs> Enterprise. Yeah. yeah, but like- These names aren't getting easier, that's no, for sure. No, they just keep making the equipment smaller and the names longer. In, in five years, it's gonna be, here's the Mavic 3 Enterprise Dual Advanced 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 Master Pro Edition. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> It'll have like a carbon fiber battery cover or something. <laughs> But um, the smaller footprints for us, um, as you know, I'm, I'm in the city. I don't have, you know, a lot of area to take off from. So we like the smaller equipment, but I also need big equipment to meet the other use cases that I have. So let me ask you a question. When it comes to like a, a drone that would work for the most amount of departments, when you think about space on a rig, when you think about portability, is it going to be one of these smaller drones that would really fit a small department, a volunteer department, an urban environment? Well, they come at the right price point, and you actually mentioned something that I didn't even think of is space on the rig, the apparatus. Um, they look tremendous, but I can guarantee if you open them up, you'll see how little room there really is actually in there. Um, smaller UAS, they have a tendency to fit, you know, anywhere. They come in a small case. You can put them in most compartments on a rig. But more importantly, everything is smaller. The battery chargers are smaller. They're, they're more capable. You could transport them. We arrive at a scene, and that doesn't necessarily mean that we don't have to go further into that scene. Figure like a wildland fire or something like that. Now you're going to need specialized equipment to get your equipment to the scene, such as, um, you know, a gator or a 4 by 4 or a pickup truck. Meanwhile, if you have, you know... A backpack, which you could honestly fit a Mavic in a backpack mm -hmm. very easily. I have two Mavics in one backpack. Exactly. And now your, your battery assortment and everything else, some extra cables and stuff, and you're pretty much self-sufficient for an hour or two. And you could do a lot in an hour or two. You could get a lot of information where it needs to go. So the smaller footprint, I think, is is 
good, but I don't want to say that it's, you know, the cure all, the end all, because if you need to do something like hazmat metering or you need advanced capabilities, you might need that larger equipment as well. But it all comes down to what you could comfortably afford in your budget, too. And budgeting is is critical, too. Um, if you have a $30,000 piece of equipment and you operate it twice a year, you just basically wasted $30,000 of funding that you could have put into equipment that you would have been using on a daily basis that you've gained become more comfortable with and building that confidence level to operate that $30,000 piece of, equi of equipment more effectively. So let me ask you this kind of drilling down. Would you argue that most uh, will, will be specific to fire departments? Would you argue that most fire departments need a small form factor a drone that has the ability to fly at night? and has dual cameras. Would you say that that is probably the best setup? Oh, absolutely. In general? Absolutely. I mean, that is where we, we don't pick the time of day, so it has to be able to operate at night. It has to be reliable too. Um, you don't want you know a piece of equipment where you spend more time working on the piece of equipment than you do actually working with the piece of equipment. Um, so reliability is definitely up there. And then you want something that's going to get good battery life. You definitely need the dual payload, especially as firefighters. You need that infrared. That is, you know, the majority of the reason why you were in the air um, is that situ situational awareness you're providing the incident commander is is crucial in both visual and IR forms. Um, so, yeah, the small footprint with, you know, the capabilities flying at night um, is just it's a go to tool. So one of the questions I have for you is, uh, you know, the Mavic 2 Enterprise Dual Advanced and the Mavic 2 Enterprise Dual both have the newer version of the Mavic 2 batteries. And I don't know if you can see it on camera, but they have this red label on them. And it's called the self-heating version of the battery. Um, you know, when it comes to these drones, I know that that feature is critical, especially in your area where it's cold a lot of a lot of the year. Um, do you know other drones that have the self-heating capability, like the Autel Evo Two Enterprise? Do you know? I don't know offhand. I have yet to actually work with a uh, Autel Evo Two, but I'm curious to see you know, what it would entail. The self-heating feature is a great feature to have. However, we do our best to maintain our batteries in a comfortable uh, environment. So we'll actually, believe it or not, our batteries are stored in a compartment that is 70 degrees. Um, it's a refrigerated slash heated compartment. Um, and that's to, to keep the batteries at a constant. And we it's part of our battery maintenance protocols. It's that and the constant, you know, updating of the batteries and the checking of the batteries and, you know, battery maintenance scheduling that allows us to really hammer in like what is going to be the best functionality for that battery. But um, as far as the self-heating function on on the batteries, I don't know any other compa uh, besides DJI that does the self-heating batteries. I was actually trying to look it up while you were talking and I cannot find uh, that those batteries are self-heating, which for me was a really big deal. It was a very, very big deal that DJI offered this. And looking at the Autel Evo 2, 2 dual radio metric, um, you know, they are touting, uh, you know, a longer flight time, but looking at the price point, it's almost double the DJI drone and not having those self-heating batteries for me, it kind of seems like a no-brainer as far as what's good for public safety. Oh, absolutely. Uh, I, I'll be honest with you. I have never had, you know, an issue with DJI when it comes to reliability and functionality. I mean, every UAS has their own little quirks and stuff, but it's by far one of the most reliable pieces of equipment, you know, that I have ever operated. So outside the Autel Evo 2 Dual, what is another comparable or the next closest comparable drone to this? Well, you would be able to go with the, the Parrot USA, the Anafi USA, and then you would be able to, uh, I believe Skydio has the XT or the... X2. Right, the X2. No, was it the X2 the blue one? No, the Skydio 2 is the blue yeah, one, yeah, but the yeah, X2, the X2, yeah. Yeah, um, and then you have, I mean, there's multiple smaller vendors that actually create, you know, pieces of equipment that are roughly the same size, but they definitely do not have the same functionality. 
Um, so as or far the as, same control distance, yeah, which is a big deal in an urban environment. It's not about the distance; it's about cutting through the noise. It's about cutting through all the interference. Yeah. So if I could, if I could, you know, they say, oh, it, it could operate ten miles away. I think, wow, that's that's pretty good. I could probably get a block and a half. <laughs> you know, in some cases, yeah. I mean, we we it's heavily Wi-Fi saturated area. They're rolling out five G all over the city. There's multiple, you know, factors. There's millions of people with cell phones and. So it's just, it's, we look at it that way. Like connectivity is crucial for us. I mean, if without the proper radio link, then this thing is, you know, up basically a flyaway at that point. So um, definitely we need the power and the control link to, to establish that. And I haven't had any issues with OcuSync at all. No, I think it's a, it's a pretty bulletproof system, frankly. I mean, it's, it's really powerful. It's, uh, it's incredibly powerful, frankly. I'm, t- I'm talking about OcuSync 1. I had no issue. Not even OcuSync. two or three. Not huh? even two or three, no. So it just really proves that when you create a reliable, cost-effective piece of equipment, it's no wonder why, you know, public agencies are going to jump all over it. I mean, reliability is also crucial because if this were to go down, they already have the systems in place to fix them or to, to send them out and get another one or replacements. And they have the care refresh program too. Which you don't have with the smaller manufacturers. Yeah. As, and if you know, if you lease this equipment, you have to hold possession of it for at least 180 days. Huh. And then after that, it's not considered a lease anymore, hmm. and which means you could lose your color if you are operating under a color. That's a very interesting point. That's a yeah. very interesting point. Well, kind of moving on to our biggest problems. We're going to try to get to a couple more here. Uh, but again, if you want to download all the biggest problems and the solutions, go to props.thedroneu.com. Uh, but one of the other biggest solutions, and I've personally seen this in multiple public safety departments, is battery management. It's, uh, it's the inability to keep batteries in a healthy state. It's the inability to keep them going. And, you know, one of the solutions that we came up with was that you've got to have uh, one day a week where you're flying because it's going to be a twofold effect. One is getting the pilot's practice, but two is cycling these batteries. So help us understand why public safety tends to rip through at least double, if not triple, the normal uh, program's uh, number of batteries. And what do you think is the solution to it? So the problem that we have is we keep our batteries fully charged. Um, we have to be ready to go at a moment's notice. We get, we don't know when the next incident is going to happen. So our batteries are fully charged and we need, if not all of them fully charged, we need enough to sustain flight continuously. So let's say it's going to take 45 minutes to charge up our batteries from storage. We need to make sure that we have enough batteries to last up to that 45 minutes and then some. So we normally on a, on a Mavic, we normally operate with a total of about eight batteries. Um, and normally those eight batteries, I'm not going to lie, are fully charged. So it's important for us to cycle these batteries to, to maintain healthy cycles and discharge and, and fly them down. Uh, make sure they're deep cycled when they're supposed to be deep cycled. Try to keep them at reasonable temperatures. There really is no solution for that on the market. But I mean, I'm just waiting for a company to actually you know, create one. And I know you and I, we have talked about this several times on what the perfect solution is, but I don't think there is a perfect solution other than flying. Uh, I agree. You're getting twofold out of it. So even if your battery charger did you well, your skills are going to diminish as well. So at that point, what's the purpose of having good batteries if you don't know how to fly? (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) that's a very important point. Now, I know in the Props Public Safety Program, you guys provided essentially another solution as far as uh, like a cycle uh, chart and a cycle calendar. So again, if you join that Props Public Safety Program, we do offer multiple solutions for you, especially when you have multiple pilots flying. But the last pro uh, prop problem that we'll go over here is it seems like public safety has an issue with public perception. Oh, absolutely. Public perception is is critical to your operations as a whole. Your public is the reason why you're there. You serve your public and they are a direct, a direct line to city hall or town hall. So public perception is, you know, a you know, a very real part of being public safety operators. It's almost 50, it's 50% of the name. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like you told me a while ago and like I even saw uh, in New York was like, you know, you'll have people who will get in the way of a police car but wave by a fire truck, you know. 
And, and so in the way to control that is kind of like what you see here on camera with this wrap that we have on this Mavic 2 Enterprise Dual, making it red, making it look like a fire engine. And and you, th you say that this helps control and aid that public perception. Well, there's many ways to aid and control public perception. And the easiest and most effective one is to engage the public. Don't keep them in the dark. You're operating your program to benefit them. You yeah. are a service to them. And if you keep that in, in your mind as a public safety operator, that you are there to serve the public. Yeah. And it, that means sometimes informing the public what you're doing. A lot of people, you know, they view as being filmed from the air as like creepy. And but guess what? If they were on the rooftop somewhere and you were trying to find a way off of them and you used a drone to do that, I bet you that perception would change. But you're not gonna have your general public in that situation. So it's important for you when you're operating and you're doing these tests in these Friday fly days, that you do it in the public eye so you could answer these questions, attend your town hall meetings, um, network with schools in the area, and uh, attend like um, different functions showcasing the equipment and its abilities to serve the public. And once the public sees your program as a benefit and not a problem, that's when you'll really get the public on board and that's when you change that perception. And it's not something that could be done easily. It's something that's very difficult to do and it's something that could, just turn around at the drop of a hat too. Like it could go great one day and then the next day it could just flip. Yeah. So it's a constant, you know, a bat, and I don't want to say it's a battle, but it's something that you've got to constantly be aware of. And it's something that you've got to constantly address. And we see the best way to do that is by, you know, interacting with the public in positive light and always shining, showing, showcasing the equipment for the tool that it is and how it's going to benefit them as a whole. Especially if, let's say, we do, we'll say accident reconstruction. Now, if you had to sit there and mark points and do that whole reconstruction, it could take several hours. Mm -hmm. But if you could clear a highway in, you know, 15, 20 minutes, well, that is a great benefit for the public. I agree. And you know, even the financial impacts are much greater than we could ever really consider. I mean, it's 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 astronomical. Well, John, thank you uh, for coming on the show today. Uh, and I know that you have a desperate purpose to help other drone programs solve their problems. And that's why you helped us develop the Props Public Safety Program. Absolutely. That's what we're here for, to pass the information down to the next generation. Awesome. Well, John, thank you very much for coming in today. Thanks for having me, Paul. All right, guys, that's going to do it for us today. Thanks again for joining us. If you have a question, go to askdroneu.com. And if you want to check out the Props Public Safety Program, you can schedule a demo on the site to get a view behind the curtain and see if it's right for your program. Check it out, props.thedroneu.com. That's going to do it for us today. Thanks again for watching another edition of Ask Drone You.